potentially a second Trump term could mean the end of American democracy as we know it. I mean, he has literally called for things like doing away with parts of the Constitution, wanting to weaponize the DOJ to enact revenge on his political enemies. The fact that he feels that he needs to lean into being a dictator alone shows that he is a weak and feeble man. He knows how to use government better this time. He can put in diehard loyalists who can weaponize every level of government against his detractors, against the American people, against the media. It's, it's almost too scary to fully wrap your head around what it could look like. Almost too scary to wrap your head around. Sarah Matthews, one of the women you just heard from there, was the former deputy press secretary for then President Donald Trump. She resigned on the evening of January 6, 2021. She went on to testify before the January 6 Select Committee. And ever since, she has been a one-woman siren warning us about what could be at stake for democracy itself should Trump return to power. Joining us at the table, the aforementioned former Trump White House Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Matthews is here. Ruth and Anthea are still with us. Uh, where are the men? Were there any? I know there were lots. You know, we have Adam Kinsinger out there. Yes, I know, and he, but he asked the same question. He says, where are the men? Exactly, but really other than that, it has been the women. I mean, my colleagues, Alyssa Ferry Griffin and uh, Cassidy Hutchinson have been sounding the alarm with me as well, as have Stephanie Grisham and Olivia Troy. And then obviously Liz Cheney is out there, but it's really only a handful of us Republicans who are out there um, sounding the alarm, particularly young women. And it's unfortunate because I think often that maybe people aren't taking the threat of Trump seriously because there aren't more Republicans out there and sounding the alarm as well. Because I know that there are so many Republican elected officials who say these things privately but would never say them publicly. So during the presidency, I had no, and I just moved, so I just found some notebooks full of people from inside the White House that Trump was right about one thing, the place leaked like a sieve, telling me how batshit crazy he was on background. What did you see and when did you see it that told you Trump was dangerous? I think I knew full well what kind of man he was when I went to go work for him. And I didn't necessarily agree with everything he said or did, but I knew that he needed people of good character to staff his administration. And so that's why I agreed to join. Look, I didn't vote for Donald Trump in 2016. And that's not something I, I think I've even said publicly. This might be wow. the first time I've said that. But I did not vote for him in 2016 because he did not win my vote over because I didn't like the character of the man. But then as we got into the administration, I saw the policies and the people he surrounded himself with. Then I, I was more OK with the idea of supporting him. And then when the opportunity came around, obviously, I jumped at it. But then I think when he refused to accept the results of the 2020 election, it started this slow burn in me where I felt really uncomfortable with the things he was saying and doing. And then obviously it was a breaking point for me on January 6th. I, and I appreciate that. I don't mean it as a recrimination. I, I just mean it as, as what can we learn from people who saw what we as a public didn't see. And I, I think we're past the point. I mean, and, and you're in very good company, Jim Mattis and John Kelly and um, all sorts of people thought they could help the country by going in after he'd won. Um, I, I want to know what you think we have a right to expect from other people like yourself who saw him up close on the inside. I mean, do you think people like Mattis and national security officials will speak out and warn the country more loudly? I think right now, um, you know, people aren't feeling as inclined to speak out. Why not? I think they they don't feel the pressure right now because we still are you know so many months away from the election, but it's going to come up quicker uh, than we realize it. And so I'm hopeful that as we get closer to then, once Donald Trump is the nominee, maybe once he's convicted, then maybe they'll feel the pressure to come forward. And that's why I'm out here speaking on these things, because I'm sticking my neck out, as are a lot of these other women that I worked with in the Trump administration. And so I hope that it inspires them to do their part, too, because I do think that they will feel a patriotic Periodic duty to come forward because they saw up close and personal how unfit Donald Trump is. He's promised to uh, punish uh, people like Bill Barr and General Milley. Should we take him seriously? I think absolutely. I think he has said himself, and that's the thing. I sound like an alarmist when I say Trump is a threat to democracy. He'll be a dictator, all these kinds of things. But if you actually look at the words he's saying, we should take him at his word because he's saying things like he wants to weaponize the DOJ to get revenge. I mean, his 2024 campaign theme is literally retribution. So I think that that just shows us what kind of leader he would be in a second Trump term. And I think something else is that when Donald Trump 
came into office in 2016, he had no idea how government worked. Mm -hmm. And now he knows how to pull those levers of government and abuse power. I mean, I think you look at um, when uh, toward the end of his administration, um, he was saying or he was appointing people as acting secretaries mm -hmm. to bypass Senate confirmation. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of things that concern me or even some of the policies, too, that he got backlash for people like John Kelly pushed back on. Um, Trump was talking about wanting to pull us out of NATO way back then mm -hmm. in like 2019. Right. So now we look at his comments today where he's basically encouraging Putin to invade our NATO allies. I think that it shows us that's the kind of uh, thing that he would be doing if he were to be president again. One of the most disturbing accounts I read was what he really thought about the men and women of the military, what he thought of people like, like General Kelly's um, son, the people who died serving the country were, were suckers. Were you aware of that at the time? And how does that make you feel now? You know, it's so funny that you asked that because I was at the White House during that time. And we were told, obviously, when he made that comment, I was not at the White House, I should clarify. But when that story in the Atlantic came to light in which it was reported on, I was working at the White House and I pushed back. Because he denied it. Because he denied it. Mm -hmm. And so did some of the staffers that were mm -hmm. on this trip with him. They said, oh, no, I never heard that. So obviously I'm going to take them at their word. But then, you know, General Kelly then came forward and, um, and now has said publicly on the record. Chairman that, Milley too. Yeah, yeah that he um, heard this comment. And so it, it makes me disappointed because I believed in him, in the former president. And I took him at his word and pushed back on it because as a spokesperson for him, that was my job. And to know that I was defending lies, it doesn't sit well with me. To know he really made those comments, it disgusts me. And um, and so now I think that you know military families need to be aware of that. This is how he talks about our members of the military. I mean, and he's showing us on full display how he thinks of uh, members of the military. You look at his comments about mm -hmm. Nikki Haley's husband. Mm -hmm. So uh, it it's really disgusting to me, and I'm saddened that I did defend that.